praise the Lord. Dearly beloved sisters and brothers, once again Father is here, greeting you all in the name of Jesus. We have now reflection for day 317 of our Bible pilgrimage. The four chapters we complete today are Ezekiel chapters 19, 20 and 21 and Gospel of Luke chapter 13. In chapter 19 of Ezekiel, it contains two lamentations, two sorrowful songs or the condition of Israel in Ezekiel's time. In the first lament, the kingdom of Judah is spoken here as a lioness and two of her verbs or two of her children, uh, they are two kings, they are lamented over. One captured and carried to Egypt, that is Jehoiahaz, the son and successor of uh, King Josiah. And another mentioned here is one carried to Babylon, who must be Jehoiakim. This lamentation for the princes of Israel, that's how the Lord says in verse 1, do you take up a lamentation for the princes of Israel? Uh, even though the northern kingdom Israel was uh, long before conquered and scattered, Ezekiel expressed the Lord's sadness over the Judean leadership's failure by chanting this lament over her final rulers prior to their deaths. Hallelujah. Jehoiahaz reigned only for a few months in 609 BC. Though his reign was short, it was evil and brutal. In 2 Kings chapter 23, we read about him. Like Jehoiahaz, Jehoiakim, he also ruled only three months before uh, his deportation to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. The statement here that he laid waste to their cities that refers to the terrifying reign of Jehoiakim. He was also a brutal king, very evil man, wicked. So that is the first lamentation. Hallelujah. In fact, it's the expression of God's own sorrow. He had chosen some people appointed, but they have been instruments uh, in uh, the ruin of the country and the people. Then verses 10 to 14, we have the second lamentation. That's the lamentation of the vine. Ezekiel is returning to the familiar image of the vine as a representative of uh, Israel. In verse 10, we read, your mother was like a vine in a vineyard transplanted by the water, fruitful and full of branches by reason of abundant water. So it's a picture of a fruitful and strong kingdom. Hallelujah. Its strongest term became a ruler's scepter. It towered aloft among the thick boughs. It was seen in its height, the mass of its branches. That's verse 11. Ezekiel probably had in mind the most glorious years of uh, Israel's monarchy, the reign of David and uh, Solomon. In those years, God lifted Israel up among other nations and towered in stature. That's the thing. In verse 12, we read, but the vine was plucked up in fury, cast down to the ground. There came a day when God had no longer blessed uh, Israel and her kings, when they persistently rebelled against the Lord. She was cast down to the ground. Verse 13, now it was transplanted in the wilderness, 
So God transplanted the vine and took it to into an unpleasant place. That's Babylon. Then in verse 14 we read, And fire has gone out from its term, has consumed its branches and fruit. Hallelujah. See, the worst damage to the vine came from one of her own branches. The fire came out. See, the corruption and destruction came from within. Actually, it's the main thing is not from outside. It was originally coming from within. So, this particular uh, branch uh, or uh, stem which is causing the fire to burn in the city or in the entire vine is consumed by uh, the fire that came from its own stem, it should be representing uh, uh, Sadekiah, King Sadekiah, who was the immediate cause of total destruction of uh, Jerusalem we had seen. Praise the Lord. So that is chapter 19. In chapter 20, Ezekiel gives a panoramic view of the history of Israel. It's practically a bigger chapter. It's in two parts. First part verses 1 to 31 is her rebellious past. And 32 to 44 the second part, her glorious future. In the first part, it surveys all that the Lord had done for uh, the nation and the nation's wickedness and unfaithfulness. So wicked the Israelites had become that God gave them over to their own evil practices in the hope that a, a sense of horror at their own deeds would choke them into into repentance. Hallelujah. Then the entire mood changes uh, dramatically uh, at words 33. In a series of words, I will, I will, the Lord promises what he will accomplish on behalf of his people. So almost 14 times we will read here, I will, I will be a king over you. I will bring them out of the land where you had sojourned. I will accept them. Uh, so I will, I will, uh, things are uh, repeated in the second part. It's a beautiful and glorious future is promised here. Praise the Lord. Chapter 21 is called uh, the sword song or the prophecy of the sword. Hallelujah. See, in this poetically powerful prophecy regarding the instrument of God's judgment against Judah and Jerusalem, the first emphasis is on the readiness of God's sword against his people. It is sharpened to make a dreadful slaughter. The army of Babylon would come against Judah. But they would come only because God put the sword of judgment into the hands of the slayer. That's why the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar is called to be the servant of Yahweh. Hallelujah. Because God is giving the sword to accomplish the judgment over his people. Then in verses 21 and 22, chapter 21, verse 21, is revealing something very important. Uh, here we read, For the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the way, at the head of the two ways, to use divination. He shakes the arrows, he consults the teraphim, he looks at the liver. See, we see three Babylonian divinatory processes. I'm not entering into it. All these three ways they use to find out what to be done. That's a kind of divination process actually. So the king Nebuchadnezzar was resorting to divination to know which way to proceed, rather which country to attack. That is uh, the situation because 
he was at the head of two ways and which way to go he was planning and so divination through divination he got uh, the answer into his right hand comes the lord for jerusalem see so the word of god wants to tell his superstition was overruled by god in order to carry out his purpose on juda the king uh, nabukadnesar might have thought that he was deciding by the help of his gods but god of israel was determining the course of his action that is a meaning so he has authority god has authority over all the divination all the black magic and all other evil thing also the and their uh, super authority is with our lord praise god so we should not be afraid of all this stuff whatever other people do also against us god has authority to bring out his plan and his will to accomplish then verses 26 and 27 is very important i read uh, 26 this says the lord remove the turban and take off the crown things shall not remain as they are then verse 27 a ruin 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 i will make it there shall not be even a trace of it until he comes until he comes whose right it is and to him i will give it two things that is the turban that is called uh, the mitre usually the bishops uh, wear this one you know that is called a mitre or the turban that was the headdress of the high priest exodus chapter 28 verse 37 speaks about it then the crown of course belonged to the king so priesthood and kingship they were both related in israel but now they both were to be interrupted set aside for a time this ruin hallelujah and verse 27 says you know actually it is one of the great messianic promises of the old testament this verse 27 the lord says it there will not be a trace of this one you know the kingship is going to be over uh so we find that you know no descendant of david would sit on the throne until he comes who comes how uh, to whom i am going to give it so it's about jesus it's the one of the beautiful messianic promise until he comes whose right it is that is god's messiah so the true son of david he will come so it is wonderfully fulfilled in jesus christ the lord says whose right it is to him i will give it hallelujah so after sadakia the kingship was over and no one became the king you know so we find like almost the the uh, the, the no descendants of uh, david uh, on the throne so the old prophecy that there will not be uh, anyone you know there will not be a, a, a what is that a succession of the kingship of uh, of the descendants of uh, david that was the promise we had seen but for some time it was it was kept underneath or what to say the lord said a ruin there shall not be even a trace of it until he comes one who has the right to it the true messiah the king of kings he will come so for some time it was set aside yeah that is the good word for it hallelujah so that is chapter 21 praise the lord gospel of luke chapter 13 we have to limit our reflection in one or two verses here so we directly go to verse 31 and 32 at that very hour some pharisees came and said to him get away from here for herod wants to kill you and he said to them go and tell that folks Behold I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course George Leo Haydock he says it is rather surprising that Christ should make use of such appropriate words 
which could be of no service to himself but which would only serve to irritate king herod should they come to his ears but christ by these words probably wished to show that he was not the least afraid of him whom the pharisees feigned to have a design on his life for it is supposed that the pharisees had invented this fiction in order to compel him to leave them quiet hallelujah so uh, cornelius alapide says he christ answered the pharisees freely and loftily when they brought up the fear of uh, herod he said that he feared neither herod nor the pharisees nor the rulers but he would continue to preach though against the will of them all until the day appointed by the father for his death he called herod a fox because he was cunning crafty and false uh, for he killed john the baptist by fraud and falsehood hallelujah then saint augustine says uh, the, the 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 lord said of herod go and tell the fox because uh, the fox was troubled what did it do it slaughtered infants what did it do it slaughtered infants in place of the infant word they were made martyrs by the shedding of their blood before they could confess the lord with their mouths and these are the first fruits that christ sent to the father an infant came and infants went an infant came to us infants went to god from the mouths of infants and sucklings you have perfected praise hallelujah so that is saint augustine hallelujah may almighty god bless you today father son and the holy spirit amen